Hello and welcome back to yet another lecture on literary theory and uh, today we will be continuing with our discussion on post structuralism and we will be doing so by focusing on the writings of Michel Foucault. Now we have already seen how the linguistic turn by the time it reaches post structuralist scholars like Rola Barth uh, starts getting a political tone, a political nuance and uh, we also found this political nuance informing Derrida's strategy of deconstruction for instance. But the political texture of language use was perhaps best explored by Michel Foucault uh, and uh, it was best exemplified by Michel Foucault's analysis of discourse. It is this concept of discourse that will form our central preoccupation in today's lecture. But before uh, we move on to the concept of discourse and its relation to power politics, let us familiarize ourselves with some biographical details about Foucault. Now, Michel Foucault was born in 1926 in Poitiers in France, mainland France. And he was educated in such prestigious institutes of higher education in Paris like Ecole Normale Supérieure and also the University of Sorbonne. He held several diplomatic posts across the world before returning to academics as a teacher. And his longest association was with the Collège de France where he was a professor of history of systems of thought. Now, Foucault was also sadly one of the earliest victims of AIDS in France and he died in 1984 at the age of 57. His book titled Folie des raisons, whose title has actually been translated variously in English as the history of madness or as madness and civilization, established Foucault's reputation as one of the major intellectuals in the early 1960s and this reputation grew with almost every subsequent publication like The Birth of the Clinic, The Order of Discourse, The Archaeology of Knowledge, Discipline and Punish, The History of Sexuality and these are the titles that I just mentioned. These are just some of the more well-known works which were published during his lifetime. Indeed, a large collection of his lectures delivered in Collège de France are still in the process of being compiled and published in the form of a series. And therefore, for the academic world at large, Foucault's writings still remain living archive. Like his contemporary Jacques Derrida, Foucault is a wonderfully eclectic scholar. If you read his writings, uh, you will be amazed by the kind of eclecticism, the kind of variety that you find there. And uh, like Derrida, he too put forward a number of novel ideas which are uh, now in use in various different academic fields like philosophy, literary studies, history of sciences, sociology and so on and so forth. But then like in our lecture on Derrida, we would not try to arrive at a comprehensive uh, picture of all of these ideas because given the time restriction, the result will only be a superficial understanding of Foucault. What we would do is we would rather approach Foucault as a post-structuralist which means that we will primarily focus on those aspects of Foucault which directly relates to the discussion on things like the author, text and language which we had initiated with our lecture on Ferdinand de Saussure. I think the best way uh, to see how Foucault built on the structuralist slash post-structuralist tradition while simultaneously critiquing it is to start with his 1969 essay titled What is an Author? Now if you remember our lecture on Bath, you will know that Bath had famously announced the death of the author as a subject who stands outside the text and pours meaning into it. Because for Bath, 
who was working along the lines of structuralism, language that formed a text was a self-contained structure whose meaning-making process depended upon the internal relations of its constituent parts. The author, as far as Bath is concerned, is a bourgeois fiction. Uh, and Derrida too, as we saw in our previous lecture, worked with the assumption that there is no external author figure who acts as a transcendental signified and who fixes the meaning within the language of a text um, while himself remaining above and beyond the text. And indeed Derrida argued that the absence of such an author figure of such a transcendental signified uh, who can fix the meaning of signifiers within a text actually results in an interminable interplay of meanings which uh, he referred through the novel concept of difference. Now Foucault in his turn approaches the issue of author and authorship through a completely different lens, through a completely different question that he poses. And the question is that even if we agree that the author as a subject is merely a bourgeois fiction, then why is such a fiction necessary? In other words, if the author is required as a concept within certain specific sociocultural and political milieus, then what guides that requirement? Even more simply put, why do we need the author? Foucault answers this question by first noting the fact that the name of the author represents a special kind of a proper noun, uh, which incorporates two different functions. The first function is of designation and the second function is of description. So, the function of designation, for instance, is something that the author's name shares with any other proper name. Uh, for instance, my name is Shion, and whenever that name is uttered, it amounts to a gesture. It amounts to a pointing of finger towards me, the human subject, right? Similarly, if I say William Shakespeare, that name too will function as a gesture which points to a specific human subject who existed as a real historical figure at a particular time and a particular place. When people like Barth and Derrida questioned the relationship between the author and the text, what they were doing was that they were questioning the existence or I should say the relevance of this real historical figure as far as the meaning making process of the text is concerned. But even if we set this designative function of the author's name aside, we are faced as Foucault shows us with the idea of author as a descriptive category. In other words, if we refer to the author William Shakespeare, for instance, what we have in mind is not simply the identity of a person, but also a description of a particular body of writing. Uh, this understanding of the author William Shakespeare as a descriptive category, for instance, will change if we come to know that the sonnets that uh, goes under the authorship of Shakespeare, the cluster of sonnets. Uh, which are attributed to Shakespeare are actually poems written by someone else. And in that case, even if the real historical person designated by the name William Shakespeare remains the same, our understanding of the author William Shakespeare is bound to change. So, even if we do not concern ourselves with the presence of a real historical person standing prior to the text and claiming to be its author, Foucault argues that we are nevertheless left with this idea of author as a descriptive category. And I quote from Foucault, marking of the edges of the text 
revealing or at least characterizing its mode of being. Now, this descriptive aspect of the author is uh, therefore distinct from and independent of the idea of author as a subject. And to make this distinction clear, Foucault refers to this descriptive aspect of authorship as the author function. Now, uh, note here that whereas the author as a human subject stands outside the language or discourse of uh, his text, the author function is integral to the textual discourse and actually emerges from within it. To understand this, uh, let us understand some of the features that Foucault ascribes to the author function. When uh, we approach the name of William Shakespeare as an author function, for instance, what it allows us to do is to identify a group of text as a single coherent and connected category. And it does so in at least four different ways. For instance, if we were to judge whether a particular piece of writing belongs to the category of Shakespeare's work or not, we try and see whether its literary value matches with the other works that are known or that are ascribed traditionally to Shakespeare. And in this, the assumption is that the name Shakespeare represents a constant level of literary value. We also see if uh, the particular piece of uh, writing under consideration coheres with the doctrines professed in the writings that are otherwise attributed to Shakespeare or not. And in this, we assume that the name of the author, in this case Shakespeare, represents a field of conceptual or theoretical coherence. Thirdly, we also note while judging whether a piece can be ascribed uh, to Shakespeare or not, whether it matches with the stylistic conventions that are otherwise followed in Shakespearean works. And here our assumption is that the name of the author signifies a stylistic unity. And finally, we also see if the piece that we are considering uh, falls within the time span in which other Shakespearean works were produced. And here the assumption is that the name of the author signifies a particular time period which brackets a specific set of social, political and economic events and therefore the work needs to either reflect them or be informed by those events. So, as you can see, the author function provides a way of clubbing together a set of texts and as such depends on the features of the discourse present within these texts. So, now that we have identified Foucault's author as author function rather than a human subject, let us return to the original question. Why do we need the author? And here of course by author I mean author function. Foucault argues that we need the author because we as a society fear the proliferation of meaning. This fear of proliferation of meaning can uh, be quite clearly seen for instance in the distinction that every society makes between discourses or utterances that are allowed and discourses that are regarded as transgressive. According to Foucault, the author function is evoked to control the transgressive discourses and the proliferation of dangerous meanings that might disrupt the existing socio-political world order. And to understand this through an example, let us take the story of Mansur al-Hallaj. Now, al-Hallaj was a Persian Sufi saint of the late 9th and early 10th century and he is best known for his utterance Ana al-Haq. Now in Arabic, this phrase Ana al-Haq literally translates into I am the truth. But the word al-Haq in the Quran is used as one of the names of Allah. So the phrase Ana al-Haq uh, 
can also be understood as meaning I am Allah. Now this second understanding of the phrase Ana al haq can in turn be interpreted in two very different ways. So for instance, the first interpretation can be that the person uttering the phrase Ana al haq is claiming to be Allah himself. The other interpretation that one might derive from this phrase is that the person uttering the phrase Ana al haq is speaking about renouncing his ego and dissolving his individual identity into the greater identity of Allah. So, as you can see here, the same piece of discourse has a potential to create a profusion of meanings if a free play of the meaning making process is allowed. Now, some of these meanings that this limitless play might generate can be positively dangerous within specific socio-political milieus. Thus, for instance, the interpretation that one who utters the phrase Ana al haq is actually claiming himself to be the almighty Allah was absolutely scandalous when articulated within the theocentric Abbasid Caliphate of the 10th century when al hallaj was living. Now, according to Foucault, the author function is needed to control this dangerous potentiality inherent in the limitless profusion of meanings. Thus, the author function can be evoked to cancel out certain possible meanings of an utterance by stating, for instance, that such a meaning is not consistent with the doctrines professed in other texts marked by the name of the same author. Alternatively, the author can be held guilty of uttering a transgressive discourse and be punished for that. So, for instance, in the 10th century Abbasid Caliphate, Mansur al Hallaj was actually condemned as a zindiq or an apostate and was sentenced to a very painful and gruesome death. Now, this punishment meted out by the Caliph did not simply kill off the person designated by the proper name Mansur al Hallaj, but also suppressed the entire category of discourse that was described by the author function indicated by the name Mansur al Hallaj. This is because all the potentially subversive meanings of the phrase Ana al Haq was erased by marking the author of that phrase as an apostate. That is, a person who has abandoned religion and therefore is not in a position to utter any meaningful discourse on the subject of God. In other words, the execution of Al Hallaj was not simply the killing of a person, but also an attempt to stop the proliferation and circulation of meanings made possible by the utterance Ana al Haq. Now, I have presented here a very selective reading of Foucault's essay, What is an Author? And uh, if you find some of the arguments that I have mentioned here to be interesting, then I would definitely recommend that you go and read the full text of the essay. It is really a very interesting piece. But even with the selective reading that we have in front of us, I would like to point out to you how Foucault intervenes into the field of structuralism post-structuralism by introducing the aspect of political power. So, in our lectures on Bath and Derrida, we had seen how a language structure can produce an infinity of meaning. But what Foucault tells us through his elaboration on the need for the author function is that this infinity of meaning within any particular social milieu is limited by a political power structure. As the story of Mansur al Hallaj shows, there are ways in which certain discourses are regularly suppressed or denied meaning within a particular society. Uh, indeed, Foucault provides a wonderful exploration of how the meaning making process is controlled and limited to allow only certain socially and politically sanctioned meanings to finally emerge. 
in the remaining part of this lecture we will focus on this particular act of Foucault's scholarship. Now some of you might have noticed that in this lecture on Foucault I have been repeatedly using the word discourse and as I mentioned in my introduction discourse forms a very crucial part of Foucault's writings but discourse is also a very commonly used word. Yet when we encounter this word in the writings of Foucault we encounter it in a very specialized sense. So in order to understand Foucault's theory about how the meaning making process underlying a discourse is limited and controlled within uh, specific socio-political milieus, let us try first to understand the word discourse in its most simplest and mundane form and then we will gradually build up from there. So if you consult a dictionary, you will see that a dictionary defines discourse as a set of meaningful statements. Meaningful statements which uh, might be made orally but also which might appear in a written form and they can be meaningful statements on any given topic. So again, the simplest definition of discourse that you will find in a dictionary is that a discourse is a set of meaningful statements made orally or in writing on any particular given topic. And this means that in the language of structuralism with which we have now developed a familiarity, discourse means something like a parole, uh, that is a concrete piece of language use. Foucault claims that there are certain deep seated regulations which structure and limit the creation and circulation of discourses. And here I am not talking about the structuring principle of Lang because even while following the structuring principle of Lang, we can theoretically say or write an infinite number of things. But what Foucault says is that though this might be possible in theory, this infinity, in practice the number of meaningful statements that we can make is actually strictly limited by certain factors. And Foucault in his essay The Order of Discourse discusses three such factors, namely taboo, madness and sanity and institutional ratification. And we will look at each of these factors one by one and we will start with the notion of taboo. Now in any society at any given point of time there are always prohibitions surrounding certain topics and these topics, these prohibited topics are regarded as taboos and any discussion on these topics are therefore socially looked down upon and consequently there is an absence of discourse on certain topics within certain social milieus. In the example of al halaj that we have uh, just discussed, speaking about oneself as God as a topic was considered to be taboo. In certain patriarchal societies for instance, talking about women's sexual rights uh, might also be considered as a taboo. Similarly, in societies which prioritize heterosexuality, the topic of homosexuality might be considered as taboo. And in each of these cases what the taboo does is that it stops the proliferation of any meaningful discourse on that particular topic. Now such prohibited subjects might vary from one society to another and from one time to another. But the fact remains and it remains constant that in any given society there will be always some subjects regarding which it will be impossible to or at least very difficult to create a socially acceptable discourse, a set of meaningful statements. Thus though in theory the topics on which we can have a discourse is infinite, in practice we can talk or write about only certain things and certain things 
are best left aside. No meaningful discourse would be entertained by the society on those specific topics. Now, apart from taboo, the notion of madness and sanity also acts as another factor limiting the possibility of discourse. For instance, if I say the elephants are flying in the air, uh, most probably I would be taken as a mad person. And what this will do to my utterances is precisely what the categorization of Mansur al-Hallaj as an apostate did to his utterances on God. It will all be made meaningless. Thus, if discourse is to be understood as composed of meaningful statements, then it follows that someone who is deemed mad cannot generate discourse. So, even though a mad person might be able to speak, might be able to utter sounds, in a society which considers that person to be mad, his speech will not be given the acceptance of a discourse. Now, the reason I mentioned that a madman's speech won't be accepted as discourse within a society that considers him to be mad is because just like taboo, the understanding of madness too is specific to certain social milieus. So, in other words, different societies separated uh, from one another spatially or temporally might construe the idea of madness differently. But irrespective of what a particular society's uh, understanding of madness is, the basic concept of madness remains present in all society. So, all society will make a distinction between what is madness and what is sane, what is guided by sanity. Which means that in any given society and at any given point in time, there will always be a group of statements which will be denied the status of discourse because of its association with madness. So, apart from taboo and madness, Foucault also talks about another factor. Foucault talks about institutional ratification uh, that limits the proliferation of discourse. And, uh, if we consider this, we will understand that our process of knowing about things and talking or writing meaningfully about them are closely guided by various institutions like our schools, colleges, the publishing industry, the news agencies, learned societies, laboratories, etc. For instance, if I were to say today that uh, the sun goes round the earth, then such a statement would not be admitted as part of a meaningful discourse because it would not be ratified by these institutes which regulate knowledge production and knowledge consumption in today's world. Yet at one point in history, this very statement that the sun revolves around the earth enjoyed institutional validity. Thus, again, uh, like taboo and madness, institutional ratification is also place and time specific. But again, like what I said about the earlier two categories, institutional ratification too would exist in some form or another in all societies. And in every society, institutional ratification will try to control the generation and the circulation of discourses that might be dangerous for the existing political power structure. So, as you can see here with the discussion of these limiting factors, we gradually move from the restricted domain of text to the domain of the socio-political context which frames the text and we had already started this movement from Bath and Derrida, but with Foucault we have reached a point that we cannot read a text on its own by merely focusing on the meaning making processes that goes on within it, but we also need to connect it with the context. And when we take up the discussion of Marxist literary theory in our next lecture, this shift from text to context or rather this relationship between the text and the context would become even more apparent. Thank you for listening.